Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about physiology, and physiology is just how the insect works on the inside. How do the organ system work, what hormones and what proteins are important, and kind of the internal structure of the insect. Most of my information from this video comes from the book, The Physiological Systems in Insects, and it's a really great book, and it's written pretty simply, and so if you don't have a really strong molecular background, then you can still get through it pretty easily. And it's free. If you're at a university or at a public library that subscribes to Elsevier, you can download the book for free. So I have a link down in the description where you can download it if you want an extra resource. And they have really great pictures. Today we're going to be covering the exoskeleton, the respiratory system, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the digestive and excretory systems, and the reproductive systems of the males and the females. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all of insect physiology, but it's a pretty good basic start for your adventures in understanding how the inside of insects work. As always, on the outline you can go right over there and you can click on each of the links and jump to that section of the video. So we're going to first start with the exoskeleton, which is kind of related to morphology because it's more outside stuff, but today we're going to be talking more about the functions of the exoskeleton and not so much the characteristics or things that you need to know on it to be able to identify insects. The purpose of the exoskeleton is very much like your skin, although it has a dual function. So like your skin, it protects the outside of the insect, it keeps stuff in that's supposed to be in and keeps stuff out that's supposed to be out, but it also provides a support structure. So the insect's skeletal system just happens to be on the outside and not on the inside like us. One of the big advantages of the exoskeleton is that you protect all that soft, squishy stuff on the inside with a hard casing on the outside. If you have an endoskeleton like we do, then you're not so lucky because all of your muscles and your tendons and some of your organs and stuff are just kind of hanging out. And if anything damages them, then it's like a really big problem. That's why internal bleeding is such a problem because we don't have something to protect your organs. You do have your skull, which protects your brain, and your ribcage, which protects your hearts and your lungs, but things like your stomach and your intestines are just kind of like hanging out and just like waiting for damage. Another advantage of the exoskeleton is that it keeps water in much, much better than anything with an endoskeleton has. So our skin is really porous and it's really easy for water to be lost, which is why you die in like three days if you don't have any water. And that's why cockroaches can go for a really, 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 really long time without drinking any water in addition to some of the other physiological things they have. But in general, insects don't have to drink as much. It's not as big of a deal for them because they keep it in a lot better than we do. One of the main disadvantages of an exoskeleton was that you just have less maneuverability in general. So the harder and thicker your exoskeleton is, the less well you can move around. So you can think about those really big beetles that are really tough and armored, but if you've ever watched them fly, then they look kind of silly because they're just like not quite as maneuverable as something as small and like soft and squishy as like an aphid. Anyway, so... If you want to talk a little bit about history, if you think about your princes and princesses and knights in shining armor in your medieval period of history, those knights would just put on a layer of exoskeleton. Their exoskeleton was metal and really heavy, but you have the same advantages and disadvantages, pretty much, as something like an insect with an exoskeleton. So, the armor did protect the knight's soft, squishy insides, however they also were a lot less maneuverable. And so it was really hard for them to swing swords, it, the armor could weigh up to 60 pounds, and if you're trying to like run somewhere and like swing a sword and stuff, then having that amount of weight on you all the time is not particularly advantageous. The other thing that also really curbed the knight's ability to use armor like that was the bow and arrow kind of became a big thing that people use. They realized that like two knights going at it with like swords was not really efficient anymore because it didn't really work. And so people decided to use bow and arrows because you could shoot and it would pierce through that armor and still damage the knight. So you had two main strategies for using a bow and arrow. The first was you could just shoot them straight up point blank and actually 
from pretty far away, the arrows would pierce the the armor and then kill your dude because it would then you know pierce their heart or whatever internal organ was important. The other strategy is if you had a knight on horseback which was running towards your tower or running towards your line of defense, the archers would shoot the arrows up and they would curve and they would come down and they would either land on the horse and kill it and the knight would fall over or they'd land around the horse and the horse would get startled and the horse would toss the knight off. The knight is then on the ground and can do pretty much nothing but wiggle around helplessly because they couldn't actually stand up in all that armor. It was too big, it was too clunky, it was too heavy, they didn't have any way to do it. And then they'd either just wait for the guy to be trampled by other horses that were coming or they would go over and just shoot him with bow and arrow again. So, the knights in shining armor, that whole kind of trend died out pretty quickly. And then they started using chainmail, which was kind of happy medium. You could still protect against, like, slicing blades, but you could also, like, still move and stuff. And so there you have it, some history related to exoskeletons. One of the neat things about the exoskeleton is while there, you have less maneuverability in it, the insect exoskeleton is relatively light for what it is, and so people have been studying the exoskeleton, and a few weeks ago actually just came out with a cast that's modeled after the insect exoskeleton, and so you have a lot more maneuverability in this cast, and it targets the area that you've specifically broken, and so this is really cool because we're actually like modeling medical advancements off of nature, which I always really like. I think it's really cool. The other problem with the exoskeleton is that you are trapped. So if you need to grow, you can't unless you break out of that exoskeleton, which means you're incredibly, incredibly vulnerable to predation while you're waiting for that new exoskeleton to harden. And we'll talk all about that in the growth and development video, but basically you're kind of a sitting duck because your new exoskeleton takes anywhere from a few hours to a full day to harden. And so if you can't walk around that well because your exoskeleton isn't hard um, or you're just really soft and squishy for that amount of time, then anything coming by that can eat you probably will. If you have an endoskeleton, however, you can just keep growing. So that's what we do as babies. When you get bigger, you just kind of generally grow. It, this molting process is what keeps insects and spiders and everything else from getting really, really huge on land. So when you all like see all those old horror movies where there's these giant spiders like crawling up the walls, well, first of all, they couldn't crawl up the walls for physical reasons, but they basically could never get that big anyway because they would have to molt. And when they molt, their new exoskeleton before it's hardened, wouldn't be able to support the insect or the arachnid or the whatever. And so it would actually just crush the inside of the insect and it would just like squish itself. And so there is a physical limit to how big insects and spiders and other arthropods can get based on that limit. So things in the ocean can get a lot bigger because their weight is supported a lot better in the water than it would be on land. Exoskeletons are also a lot easier to hook muscles up to, and so you get better leverage, and so you need less force to move your muscles around. Inside the exoskeleton, there are these little like projection growths that the muscles actually attach to, and so insects can move around with a lot less force than things with an endoskeleton can. However, there are a few like weird examples of animals that have both an endo and exoskeleton, and an example would be like a turtle. So they have their internal bones and their vertebrate, just like we are, but they also have that shell, which is actually part of their rib cage that has um, grown out and flattened and hardened into the shell. So they have both all the advantages and disadvantages of an endo and exoskeleton. Next, we're going to talk about the respiratory system, which is an open system. So people and vertebrates have what's called a closed respiratory system. So we have our lungs, and our lungs are hooked up to the heart and the blood vessels, and it's very controlled where the diffusion happens and then how that oxygen gets transported. Insects have the open respiratory system, which is just basically tubes that stick out on the inside, which gets to smaller tubes, which get to smaller tubes, which get to smaller tubes, and the oxygen just diffuses into the cells that way. 
a lot of these tubes in the respiratory system have been named because people think that they're particularly important. And the first part to these tubes are the spiracles. And the spiracles are the little openings on the outside of the insect that let air in. And they can open and they can close. And you find them on the thorax and the abdomen. There's been a reduction towards fewer fewer spiracles just because the more spiracles you have, the more water you can let out and obviously letting water out especially if you live somewhere where there's not that much water is kind of a problem so generally insects have been going in the trend of reducing the number of spiracles that they have the spiracles go into bigger tubes called the trachea and so insects have a big tracheal system that runs all throughout the insect this tracheal system just houses oxygen and oxygen just kind of flows through it from the tracheal system, the tubes break down into smaller tubes called tracheoles, and those tracheoles can be as wide as a cell in diameter, and so oxygen goes from the tracheal system into the tracheoles and then into a cell or the bundle of cells, and oxygen just diffuses straight into that area. This is why it's thought that insects aren't huge anymore, so while you may think that a praying mantis that's six inches long is really huge. It's nothing compared to the dragonflies of the dinosaur age that used to be up to three feet, which is amazing. And there is a millipede that grew up to eight feet, which is also really huge. Anyway, but it's thought that insects and arthropods back in the day could get that big because there was more oxygen in the atmosphere. And so this whole kind of slow diffusion process was a bit more efficient than it is now. And that's why insects aren't huge anymore. This system works all fine and dandy if you're an insect that lives on land. But if you're an insect that lives in the water, your life is slightly more complicated. And there's a lot of really cool ways that insects can deal with living underwater. The first way that insects can just handle being underwater is by being all old school and just having gills. And there are lots of insects that just have external gills. And a really good example is your damselfly and dragonfly larva, and some of your stoneflies do as well. Another really good option is just to have a spiracle that sticks out of your body a little bit. And a lot of times these spiracles are covered in hair. And so when the insect is swimming around underwater, then the hair is covering the spiracle and water doesn't get in. And then when they need to take a breath, they'll go up to the surface and open that ring of hairs, which prevents water from flooding into the spiracle, but air can come in. And then when they have enough, they'll close it and then swim underwater again. And this is really, really typical of your mosquito larva. A third option is just to extend your tracheal system in a system called respiratory filaments. And this is basically just the tracheal system has elongated, usually out of the abdomen, and so the insect can sit somewhere and stick this elongated tube up to the surface, kind of like snorkel gear, and just sit there and absorb oxygen from the surface of the water. A fourth way, which is really cool, is you can have abdominal spiracles that are a little bit pointy and stick out a little bit, and you can attach to a plant and stick those abdominal segments into the intercellular airspace of the plant and just steal air from the plant that way and that way that's really good because you never have to surface and there's nothing attached to you that predators could grab onto. The last one is my personal favorite because the insect actually carries around a scuba gear kit with them. So basically there's a, this thing called a plastron which is basically just a kind of a roughed up area around a spiracle which traps an air bubble and this air bubble is really cool because since it creates a concentration gradient, oxygen freely diffuses in and carbon dioxide diffuses out. And so the insect can actually carry this bubble around for a while and it acts like an external gill. My favorite example of this is of a spider. And so if you're afraid of spiders, then I should tell you that the water is no safer than anywhere else. <laughs> but there's a spider, it's a diving bell spider, and it will go up to the surface and has like really fuzzy legs and stuff and grabs an air bubble down. The air bubble then it spins into a web and will sit in this air bubble 
inside its web and wait for stuff to swim by and get caught or just grab stuff. And so the spider only has to surface like every day. Sometimes it can even extend it to like two days because that air bubble is big enough to always diffuse in oxygen and diffuse out carbon dioxide. There is one family of insects that have hemoglobin and it's the chironomid midge. And I think it has hemoglobin because its larva lives in really poor environments. They can live in really, really polluted areas. And so the hemoglobin probably just helps them acquire more oxygen from their otherwise unfavorable environment. But when you look at the larva, they're red. And that's because you're seeing the hemoglobin. The next system is the circulatory system, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, but it's pretty complicated all around. The circulatory system, the most interesting thing about it is that it's also an open system. And so while we have these little nice little blood vessels that bring blood, oxygenated blood around to places that we think are important, like our muscles and our digestive system and our brain, insects are just kind of a shell with slosh inside of them. And that slosh is their blood or hemolymph. And so that's why when you step on an insect, they kind of just like explode. And that's because you're breaking the only thing that's keeping the blood inside of them. It's really important for some insects to keep their body under high pressure all the time. Things like caterpillars move by what's called hydrostatic pressure when they increase the pressure by constricting muscles in that area and so the water moving is actually what propels them forward and so caterpillars are a really good example of this kind of movement so they're pretty tightly packaged with a lot a lot of pressure inside of their body. The hemolymph does things that you would expect blood to do. So it brings nutrients around to the body, it brings oxygen around in the body, and it provides a pretty basic immune system. And depending on your insects, some insects have a better immune system than other insects. The main sugar that insects use is tree halose and not glucose like we use. And tree halose just like flows around in the hemolymph. Tree halose is a little bit better than glucose uh, because it prevents the insect from dehydrating as easily. So basically what happens if the insect is about to dehydrate, the inside of the insect kind of turns into this like gel instead of just like completely desiccating. And so it helps the insect stay alive a bit better than glucose would. Also inside the hemolymph are hemocytes, and hemocytes are just blood cells. Some of them have an immune response, although not all insects have a strong immune system. So aphids have basically no immune system. They, they're kind of awful. And some things like cockroaches and flies have a really, really strong immune system. It was thought for a while that insects just didn't have immune systems because they didn't need to put the energy into having them, but it turns out that they do. And they have a really, really simple immune system. They have, if something comes in that's not supposed to, they have an encapsulation response, which just means that the insect cells kind of, kind of form a bubble around it and then either dissolve it or just kind of like stays there and basically forms like scar tissue. And then it melanizes or becomes hardened, kind of like the exoskeleton, and then you just have this like bubble of stuff or it gets like moved out. If the insect has damage to its exoskeleton, then you get a melanization or tanning response where you have just a repair system of the of the exoskeleton. Insects have a lot of relationships with other kind of organisms, so like bacteria and protozoa and viruses and fungus, and usually these are mutualistic endosymbiotic relationships, which just means that the sem symbiotic organism lives within the insect. And sometimes these can be housed in specialized fat body cells called bacteriocytes, and sometimes these other organisms just like float around inside the hemolymph. The first thing that symbionts can do is aid in nutrition. So aphids have a bacteria called Buchnera, which provides amino acids that the aphid otherwise wouldn't get in its phloem and sap-based diet. Similarly, mosquitoes have a gut symbiont that produces 
sugars because the mosquito will be mainly drinking blood and so they aren't getting sugars and termites have a protozoa which helps digest the cellulose that the termite otherwise wouldn't be able to break down by itself. Symbionts can also allow the insect to utilize different host species. So the aphid has a symbiont that allows it to utilize different plants for food sources and some others allow wasps to lay their eggs into hosts that they otherwise wouldn't normally be able to. These symbionts can protect against predators or parasites, and so some of these bacterial associations can prevent the, the insect from succumbing to fungal infections. Others, like Hamiltonella defensa, which is a symbiont found in aphids, they can prevent the parasitic wasp larva from developing inside the aphid and basically how that works is that Hamiltonella defensa has a virus and the virus encodes a toxin and releases it and kills the wasp larva. How it kills the wasp larva and not the aphid is unknown currently but it's a really interesting system because it's the aphid with a symbiosis, a parasitic symbiosis with a wasp, but the aphid has a symbiotic association with a bacteria that has a symbiotic association with a virus, which makes the whole thing work, which is really crazy. One of the last things that symbionts can do is to break down harmful environmental compounds, and a really cool example of this is a bug that is found pretty sure in Japan, and they found that they have a symbiont that aids in nutrition and stuff, but also breaks down a certain pesticide, and so this bug is completely immune to the certain type of pesticide because a bacteria that it picks up from the soil every generation can naturally break down that pesticide. Which is really surprising that this bug picked up this bacteria, but it's not surprising that the bacteria can break down the compounds because a lot of our commercial pesticides that we use are designed to be broken down in the soil by bacteria so we don't poison other things around the cropland that we're not supposed to. The important piping system in the circulatory system is the dorsal vessel, and it is comprised of the heart, which is located in the abdomen, and the aorta, which runs up the length of the abdomen up through the thorax. The aorta is open-ended on one side, and all along the heart and a little bit into the aorta are these little holes called ostia, and that's where hemolymph can enter into the system. So the heart goes pump, 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 as you would expect any heart to do, and the hemolymph enters through the ostia and gets shot up through the aorta, and so the whole purpose of the system is to bring hemolymph that's oxygenated and full of nutrients into the dorsal vessel and so it gets squirted out towards the head and so the brain can get all this good stuff like oxygen and nutrients and that's how hemolymph cycles inside the insect. The next system we're going to talk about is the nervous system and while insects do have a kind of central nervous system which mainly comprises of the brain and a couple other important organs, they don't it's, their nervous system isn't as integral to their survival as ours is, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. The brain is comprised of three main parts. There's the protocerebrum, which pretty much gets, gets all the sensory information from the eyes and the ocelli, the deutocerebrum, which produces neurons to simulate the antennae, and the tritocerebrum, which connects the that connects the insect brain to the rest of the insect's organs. There's not too much known about the tritocerebrum right now, so in the future, hopefully we'll find out a little bit more about what it does. The next part is the mushroom bodies, and they sit right in the front of the head of the insect, and they pick up a lot of the mechanosensory and gustatory signals from the antennae. They're useful and thought to be related to olfactory senses and learning, and they talk a lot to the tritocerebrum and receive a lot of information and some of that information is thought to be gustatory or tasting and smelling and mechanosensory information. There are a few other parts of the brain but they're really important for hormones and we're going to talk a little bit about them more in the growth and development section so just know that there are some other parts of the brain that we'll talk about a little bit later that are also really important. The rest of the nervous system is broken up into these ganglia, and these ganglia are just kind of little pods of nervous system tissue that branches out into the different muscles, into the different tissues that 
uh, are necessary. And so there are a bunch of these ganglia that line down the side of the insect, and these are mainly what's responsible for moving the insect. The first ganglion is really important, and this is a subesophageal ganglion, and this controls the salivary glands and the mouth parts. After that, the rest of the ganglion just kind of control and move organs, muscle, tissue that they're around. Because the ganglia are responsible for moving the insect around, the only thing the brain really does is interpret sensory information, which is important, but the insect can live and move and pretty much function without its head. That's why you've heard that a cockroach can live for seven days with its head cut off, and that's because the cockroach doesn't need its head to move its body, and it just dies of starvation because it doesn't have mouth parts to eat food anymore. I had a really interesting experience with this with my pet mantis. I fed her a cricket, and she decided that she only wanted to eat the head and not the rest of it. And so there was a headless grasshopper in the bottom of the tank and I just kind of didn't really think about it and took the lid off and like went to grab the grasshopper but I like scared it and it jumped and that was really weird and it's the only time I've been afraid of a bug is when I had like a headless zombie cricket like jumping around in my apartment that I had it like find and I really didn't know what to do with it so I just like put it outside. <laughs> Because insect nervous systems are so simple, people are using cockroaches to understand the nervous system a bit better and to do kind of weird things with it. So one of the things that you can do with your classroom, and I'll have a video linked right up there so you can click it and see everything that you need, but basically you can hook an iPod up to a cockroach leg and the cockroach leg can stay alive and functioning for up to three days. And so you take an iPod and you connect it to the cockroach leg and if you play music through it, then the cockroach leg will wiggle in rhythm to whatever music you're playing and that's because the electrical signals from your iPod are stimulating the neurons and the muscle tissue in the cockroach leg and so that's what makes it wiggle and again there's a video right up there so you can look at it if you want to demonstrate this to your class. Another really interesting example is people are using the Xbox Kinect and are attaching little um, units to the cockroach and having the cockroach like walk around and actually controlling the cockroach on predetermined paths using the Xbox Connect and the Xbox Connect is co collecting a lot of data about neurological impulses and signaling and so we're actually using gaming technology to make little what's called bio robots. The next system that we're going to talk about is the Digestive and excretory systems, and I lump them together because um, they're really, really closely related, and you can't really talk about one without the other. But basically, the digestive system starts with the mouth and goes into the foregut, and you have the esophagus that connects your mouth to the foregut. The foregut can sometimes be modified and have little parts sticking off of it called a crop, and sometimes that's there and helps insects just store food for a while and they can just like hold food into the crop and then so if they walk around for a while then they get hungry and there's no food around then they're not completely at a loss. They can still make up for that lack of food. Then you have the proventriculus which is kind of like the valve between the foregut and the and the midgut. And the proventriculus is that part that I was talking about on the fleas. That's where the biofilm would build up on. The midgut is responsible for all of your normal digestion and it's a pretty long complicated process but you break things down and then you can shuttle it through the midgut wall. And the hemolymph surrounding the midgut is what becomes concentrated with all those nutrients, which is why it's really important to circulate that hemolymph throughout the insect so all of the organs and all of the muscles and the brain get those important proteins and sugars and all that good stuff. And then the midgut breaks off uh, into the malpigian tubules and then into the hindgut. And the malpigian tubules and the hindgut are really, really important for water balance and excretion. Some insects have pre-digestion, which is often seen in your hemipterans, the especially the predatory ones, where they'll inject their beak into the substrate, host, plant, whatever, and they'll release digestive enzymes through that 
through the beak as well. And so they'll kind of like spit this mixture out into whatever they're eating. And then that mixture will help digest some of the harder things around it. And then the insect will slurp it all back up through the beak. And so by the time it gets to their foregut, it's already been digested a bit, which makes the whole process a little bit faster and a little bit easier. Before I get too far into how the whole excretion process happens, you should probably know that there are three major forms of nitrogen that insects release. And the first is ammonia, which is highly, highly, highly toxic, but doesn't take that much energy to form. And so a lot of your aquatic insects, especially your uh, larval or nymphal stages that are always in the water will just excrete pure ammonia because it's cheaper to make and you don't have to worry about it poisoning you because the water is all around you just flushing it out. The second is urea which is what we also produce and some moths make urea too and it's kind of like the next step. It takes a little bit more energy to make and you need less water than you would for ammonia to excrete it, but you still need a decent amount of water to make sure that this nitrogen doesn't build up and it's like really toxic. The third type is uric acid, which takes a decent amount of energy to make, but is relatively non-toxic, and so you don't need a lot of water to flush it out. And so a lot of insects choose to have uric acid instead of the other two because that conserves a lot of water. And what's really interesting is that cockroaches have a symbiotic bacteria that actually helps them store some of this uric acid. And if the cockroach gets, gets into hard times, doesn't have a lot of food, this bacteria will help break down the uric acid back into nitrogen. And so the cockroach can use it to form amino acids and stuff. The other cool thing about uric acid is that a lot of insects, especially if you're a desert dwelling insect, can just excrete crystalline uric acid instead of having to mix it with any kind of water. And so it's really, really good to just prevent water loss and you keep a lot more water with you, which is why insects rule the world. The malpigian tubules lay right behind the midgut and are responsible for most of the filtration in the insect. They're pretty much akin to our kidneys, although they work in a slightly different fashion. So the movement of ions is pretty much what drives that filtration mechanism versus our kidneys that rely on hydrostatic pressure. But from the malpigian tubules, all of that stuff then moves into the hindgut. So the malpigian tubules have just moved a watery, iony, and waste slosh into the hindgut. And the hindgut's job is then to take the water and the important ions from that kind of sloshy mixture and release it back into the hemolymph so it can be reabsorbed and reused by the malpigian tubules. Anything that hasn't been reabsorbed is waste and then leaves the insect as whatever waste form it produces, whether it be uric acid, urea, or ammonia. And the final systems we're going to talk about are the reproductive systems and we're going to be talking about both the male and the female reproductive systems. The males make sperm or spermatozoa and are made in the testes and many many insects produce what's called a sperm packet. So it's not just sperm, there's a lot of other protein and there's a lot of other nutritious stuff coating the sperm and so when the male puts this sperm packet in the female so you can digest a lot of it and use a lot of the nutrients. A lot of the times if you see butterflies like sitting together on a riverbank or on a dead fish or whatever, they're absorbing a lot of amino acids they haven't gotten since they just pupated and are trying to get some of those salts and amino acids to make a good sperm packet for the female. The seminal vesicle is used to store that mature sperm, and then the adiagus, or the insect's penis, is used to insert the, uh, the sperm packet in the female. So insects have internal fertilization. Some males have a secondary sex organ, like the dragonflies, and others have pretty interesting sexual encounters with their female. 
There are some insects, like hemipterans, where the males will just come over and just stab the female anywhere, and she'll just become fertilized. It's called traumatic insemination. And sometimes some males will accidentally stab other males, and they're finding now that females that look more like males are being stabbed less. There's also another example where there's a, a weevil, and its adiagus pretty much looks like a mace, and that's because sexual selection is so high that the male does not want the female mating with any other males because he wants just his genes to be passed down and not anyone else's. And so his adiagus is really spiky, so when he has intercourse with the female, um, he actually ruins her reproductive tract and she cannot physically meet with any other male. Sometimes she's killed in this process, which is unfortunate. The honeybee is another interesting example because the female will go on her nuptial flight when she's going to be a new queen, and in that nuptial flight, she mates, and then when she lands, produces a colony. During that nuptial flight, she releases a lot of this pheromone, so all the males ever in that area fly up and chase her. So they're chasing her, and they also don't want the other males to mate with her, so they, they punch each other and beat each other out of the air, and they die and they fight so the fastest flying and less and not damaged male catches up to the queen and he'll mate with her when he mates with her his adiagus comes off and gets stuck in her track in her reproductive tract and he falls to the ground and like bleeds out and dies and that's that's it for him so the next male will come up to her and he'll go to have sex with her but he can't because there's another male's penis in the way and so honeybee adiaguses have a little hook at the end of them so the second male can come and pull the sperm plug out of the female and then insert his adiagus and then his gets stuck and then he dies it's in the female's best interest to have as many males as possible meet with her because that way you get more genes in and you get more kind of uh, gene flow and you have more genetic diversity so if something goes wrong then your your colony and your family is still a-okay but the males are really selfish and just want their genes to be passed down because they want to be the most successful for them and so that means just their genes get passed down and no other males do but you can see a lot of the genetic diversity in honeybees if you actually look at a honeybee colony they'll all be like slightly different colors and shades and hues and stuff and that's because there is this genetic diversity because the queen mates with multiple males in her flight. The female reproductive tract is pretty much just responsible for making eggs and so the eggs are formed in the ovaries or in the ovarials and when the egg matures it comes down the common oviduct and is fertilized. The egg has a little hole in it called a microfile and that's where the sperm can actually enter the egg and do the fertilization, but the egg also has aerophiles, which are small, itty bitty, tiny holes in the egg, and this allows air to get in, and so that way the developing embryo still has access to oxygen that it needs. The egg is fertilized with sperm from the spermatheca, which is an organ that female insects have to store sperm. So they can mate multiple times with multiple males and then hold the sperm in the spermatheca for sometimes up to six months. And the female insect can choose which male sperm to use and will use that to fertilize the egg and sometimes just reabsorb the other sperm for nutrients. If the female isn't fertilized or she's going through a hard time, like it's there's not much food or there's not much water, she can reabsorb the eggs and then use that for extra nutrition. There are accessory glands in the female reproductive tract and in some insects like praying mantises and cockroaches that make an uotheca or that big casing around the eggs, that's what the accessory glands do. They provide those extra casing where if eggs are coupled together and be packaged somehow, that's what the accessory glands do. And then that whole bundle or just those eggs will go through and leave the vagina and go out the ovipositor and then the female can lay the eggs wherever she wants. Mate recognition is really really important and sometimes this signal can be messed up a little bit and be messed up by really strange 
things. For example, there's a beetle, and I think it lives in Australia, that recognizes the female based on her color, her size, the bigger the better, and her elytra is like dimpled and patterned and so that those are the three things that they go and look for however there is an australian beer bottle that has basically the same coloration is huge and has that same dimply pattern on it and so all of these male beetles will sit on the litter of like of all these old thrown out beer bottles and try and meet these beer bottles and so the females are actually being neglected so this litter is actually becoming a problem for this species Insects have some weird ways to reproduce, and one of the first ones that's really weird is seen in all of your hymenopterans, all of your bees, wasps, and ants, and it's called haplodiploidy. And this is when you get males from unfertilized eggs and females from fertilized eggs. So you can have a male, and he won't have a father, but he'll have a grandfather, and that's just, like, kind of weird. The other is parthenogenesis, where a female will just make clones of herself and doesn't need to be fertilized at all. And she'll just, like, pop out exact clones of herself. And aphids do this all the time. Some aphids have a sexual stage when it gets cold or in the winter. But for the most part, especially during the summer months, the females just give birth to more females and males aren't even part of the equation. In this stage of parthenogenesis for aphids, they even produce live young and so they skip the whole egg thing altogether. Female aphids are really interesting because they have what's called telescoping generations. So you have a mom and when she gives birth, that offspring is both a mom and a grandma at the same time because the embryo that is put out and is like a first instar is already pregnant and then like her offspring already pregnant inside of that. And so all of aphids, all they do, all they're good at is reproducing and making more of them. So they have like no immune system and they just kind of like sit on plants, don't really move. It's like all they do is reproduce. And the third one that's pretty interesting is in all of your Lepidoptera, so all of your butterflies and moths, and they have what's called ZZ sex determination. And that's because the males are like XX and the females are like XY, but since that's weird and confusing, they just change the lettering. So males are ZZ and females are ZW. And so... The males are the one that have the same sex chromosomes and the females are the ones that are different, which is really, really interesting if you're doing Punnett squares and talking about genetics in high school because all of the sex-linked traits in Lepidoptera are transferred through the females and not through the males, and that's so cool. So one of the really, really big examples is the... Um, is the eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly and this butterfly has a dark morph and a yellow morph and the dark morph is due to improper timing of scale development when pigment is being put is being put down and this is specifically a sex linked trait so if you find a dark morph of this eastern tiger swallowtail it is a female because it's only seen in females it's pretty cool so that was a super abridged version of insect physiology. If you want to anything more in detail, you can feel free to leave a comment. You can email me. You can message me. You can whatever, and I'll try and answer all of your questions. And again, I've linked the book that I got a lot of this information from in the description.